So let's move on now. I think we've kind of really spent quite a lot of time on hormone receptor positive breast cancer and go to another topic that I think is going to be quite exciting to talk about at, at this year's ASCO, uh, and that's the treatment of HER2 positive disease. And first, let's talk a little bit about some data that has been presented over the last year, then we'll kind of go forward a little bit and talk about some things I think that are going to be coming out in the not too distant future. Uh, the first thing is really to talk about um, the treatment uh, first line, HER2 positive metastatic disease. Um, uh, Cleopatra, uh, which is pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and docetaxel, uh, is now, I believe, considered the standard of care for the treatment of HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, and, you know, the, it really, there's a, there's a substantial uh, increase uh, in progression-free survival. And now we actually, Joyce, have data showing, uh, at least from San Antonio, uh, showing an overall survival increase, almost up to five years. Can you mm, comment on that? Yeah. It's really, it's big, you know, then I think it kind of compels us to really use that triplet first line of taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. It's, I think it's got to be our first line therapy because it was a 15-month improvement in overall survival, an absolute 15-month. And as you said, it's pushing up five years, 56 and a half months median overall survival, which is unprecedented in terms of first line metastatic um, survival in any uh, subset. So I think that's pretty compelling data. And... Um, of course, that's why it got moved into the adjuvant setting. We await those data. But yeah, I think it's really standard whether it's ER positive, whether it's ER negative, whether it's the patient is pretreated with trastuzumab or not, even though there was only 11% that um, was had been pretreated with trastuzumab, they still have the same benefit, the same relative benefit from the addition of the pertuzumab. So I think, you know, it's certainly my uh, standard of care. Is it everybody's pretty much standard of care? Do we care about the taxane? That was always a question people had, I think, when this initially came out a couple years ago. Does the taxane matter for this? Probably does. Uh, if you oh, it look does, at really? the, Well, if you yeah. look at Neosphere, yeah. right, that's a good signal that you need that uh, stress from chemotherapy in order for the oncogene to be right. useful to that cell, and then you come with the two antibodies. You know, I think it's, it's good to reflect on, on how the HER2 positive field has evolved, and, you know, I think that uh, we found this very dominant oncogene and basically, uh, the royal we developed drugs that optimize the hitting of that target. You know, instead of being distracted by other parts of the cell, it was just targeting on that receptor, optimizing things like TDM1 just to maximize the U because we knew that that was the culprit. So, and I think that this is, these results are basically a testament to just, that. Just, just to clarify, I think you were referring to the use of a taxane as opposed to no chemo at all. Yeah. Because I think Adam's yeah. question was whether Which the so, well, type no, that's of a taxane, question too. But, but I think that's an, a very important question. I, mean, I certainly agree that you want a, a taxane with pertuzumab and trastuzumab. And then as in the trial, the pivotal trial, it, you, you can drop the, the taxane. Uh, the question though is, you know, is paclitaxel and docetaxel, are they interchangeable? And we don't formally know the, the question to that, an, the answer to that question. We do know that um, in a pilot to smaller study, that, that, that the smaller studies that have been done with paclitaxel, that you do get at least initial responses and time to progressions that are comparable. I personally think that you can substitute, uh, my first choice is still docetaxel but many times patients may have received docetaxel in the past uh, and then, uh, you know, yeah. in those patients... Yeah, thanks for that clarification. My, my response was geared toward the need of chemotherapy. Chemo, chemo at all. Right, 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 right. Sorry about... Yeah. So here's... But here, you know, Carlos, again, you're still in great ideas here, you know, oh. that are coming out, so this is great. So we know that's going to be presented uh, probably again in the next few days, the Mary Ann study. And just for everybody's knowledge, Mary Ann was docetaxel, trastuzumab, this is first-line therapy versus... TDM1 versus TDM1 and pertuzumab. Go ahead, you're going to say something? Just to clarify, the, the taxane, trastuzumab, allowed either docetaxel or weekly paclitaxel. Oh, it did, and I forgot that. I thought it was docetaxel only. Okay, I stand corrected. Yes. But yes. nonetheless, it was yeah. a taxane. Good it was point. a standard that we normally use in the, in the pre-pertuzumab days. And what we can gather from the press release, again, we're doing oncology by press release right now, um, we gather from the press release that there is no difference between the three arms of the study. Statistically, as far as we know, at this point in time, we'll know in a few days, but right now we have to do this kind of based on what we know. So go ahead, you want to, you, Edith, you're, you're busting to, to say something. So as, as, a senior author, as a bit. senior author of the abstract. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, again, go ahead. Okay, but uh, as, as per the press release, uh, it, was, it was a non-inferior outcome. Right. A little bit different, you know, statistical terminology. Then superior, uh, I agree. Just to, just to clarify that, that, that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the main issue, and uh, Marianne, 
uh, was really that the, the dual blockade using uh, TDM1 in combination with pertuzumab did not show superiority over taxing uh, trastuzumab or over TDM1 alone. So, I mean, the question that gets to the, gets to the mechanism of what these things really are doing. So, in other words, why should, if, if this really is a molecule, okay, that is a, uh, it's, HER2 is the backbone, yes. right? Yes. It's the backbone of that. It's the backbone of trastuzumab. Yes. Yet you don't see synergy. You see synergy in one setting, but not the other. So what is TDM1 really doing? Is it really trastuzumab? Well, I, is it I think really the, chemo? Is it somehow a little of both, but it, not a lot? What is it? Targeted chemo. Well, couple. Go, go it, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's it, you know, it, it's designed obviously to be a targeted payload delivery to her two expressing cells, and and presumably that's how it works. It's a highly toxic molecule. Uh, and internalization. However, the question is, is there some signaling going on? You know, our best uh, thinking about the way trastuzumab works in general is that it, it probably does inhibit signaling and it's probably, there's an immune mechanism as well. Um, with TDM1, you probably don't have the immune mechanism because you don't have the FC portion available, but you may get a signaling impact. In fact, I remember Ian Kropp presented some data early on where there seemed to be a difference depending on the PI3 kinase status of a tumor, but I don't know if that's held up. It was a very small number, and that may not be something to really hang your hat on, but uh, I, I think, you know, e Edith obviously may have some thoughts, and Carlos as well. Uh, on, on how TDM1 is working, uh, whether it's a combination of signaling and, yeah. and payload, but it's designed really for, as a payload, as a, the key. Just, uh, just a point of, of clarification, Mark Slikowski published a paper showing that TDM1 retains the antibody-like activity of so the ADCC. retains ADCC, okay. correct. Yes. Yes. Now, so you're, injecting, you're giving a lot less of the drug, so... so a right, right, right. You know, a hypothesis, a hypothesis is that, of course, TDM1's got to have HER2 present to get internalized, to deliver its payload, and it may be that the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab in the form of TDM1 is so good at getting that receptor off the cell surface that over time you're just running out of HER2. Good and point. that's great from a signaling standpoint, but not so great from the point of view of payload. delivering the payload. payload. Yeah. That's, that's that's, Again, we're speculating, you know, Edith is smiling really know, like though. the Cheshire you know. cat over there. You know, we can't really, we're commenting yeah. on the press well, release. The, the, data are the data. It, it does sense. make sense. <laughs> make sense. I, Joyce, I think that's a great point. I wonder how we could test the way to even test that. You know, I don't know. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, not infrequently when we re-biopsy patients that are HER2 positive, the pathologist would say that, you know, that they no longer see that membrane staining. Yes. These are patients who have been right. on Herceptin for a while. That's a good point. And in the laboratory, you can show it very easily that the receptor disappears from the cell surface. So I like the hypothesis yeah. of, of Joyce. That's great. <laughs> that's a, I think that's really cool. I don't think it's my hypothesis. Well, stay tuned. So hopefully, you know, after you see ASCO, people watching this, after they see ASCO, they can hear what we've said, you know, with one person who actually does know the data and four who do not. But, but this brings, I just want to bring up another, and this is a very practical point, is how we start to uh, use all the data in real life when the drugs are changing. So, for example, what is the efficacy of TDM1 in patients who are progressing on pertuzumab-based therapy? We, we, we don't know the answer to that, and and we need we need to we need to get the we need to get that information. So, so if the receptor is downregulated, it right. wouldn't do a whole it lot. It shouldn't work because there's <laughs> right. no target, right? Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So let's briefly talk about Bolera one, and then go to the, I think the next big thing uh, at uh, ASCO this year. But first, Bolera one at last year's ASCO. We're actually at San Antonio. Uh, uh, Sarah Hurwitz presented the data uh, on the use of um, Verulimus uh, with paclitaxel uh, and trastuzumab. Uh, and any comments on that? Yeah, I wanted to make one. Uh, I'll say, because uh, I was just thinking it's kind of similar to Bolero 3. The um, Bolero 3 was a positive study for PFS, but it wasn't gangbusters. You know, it was the addition of the Everolimus and the HER2 positive. Bolero 3 was. A vinarel beam with trastuzumab plus minus, and then Bolero 1 was paclitaxel with trastuzumab plus minus. And um, Bolero 1, unfortunately, was a negative study, but both of the studies showed that the benefit that was seen, and there was a, some, was an ER negative. And the hypothesis was that maybe what uh, Carlo said about when you inhibit the PI3 kinase pathway, up comes ER. And ER was basically you know, if you're upregulating ER, maybe a mechanism of resistance to the, um, to the, to the uh, everolimus, you know, which we, is we, why you have to block ER when you use everolimus. So that's a hypothesis. But um, it did, both of those studies have shown sort of a signal for the use of um, everolimus in HER2 
positive uh, ER negative breast cancers, um, but um, neither it hasn't been um, approved in the Bolero three situation. So it's not an, an on label approach. Having said that, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable in the in a patient if you could get you new know, insurance coverage for it who's had multiple other lines of therapy. Given the data, you know, to go ahead and uh, try it for the patient. Yeah. So I mean, that gets to the point. So now we have Bolero one, which is kind of the same thing. You know, not quite you know, a significant survival, a PFS benefit, but there could be something there if you look at subsets. I mean, what are your thoughts, you know, thought? Well, I think one thing I, that's interesting is those trials in the hormone positive didn't allow an anti-estrogen therapy. Yes. So I think that's a big point to, you know, I think in practice that's not exactly um, how the community standard is once you finish your chemotherapy. So, you know, the role that played in distinguishing the benefit in the hormone negative, um, you know, raises a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. All right, so let's move on.